Chairman Ralston has been detained. He asked me to to uh, commence the meeting in the interest of time. And uh, we are going to be taking up first HB 1167, Representative Butler. Are there questions from the committee? Questions from the committee? Uh, I don't hear any questions. Go ahead, Representative Franklin. Uh, I move House Bill 1167 do pass. Second. We have a do pass and a second. All those in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. It appears to pass. Thank you very much, Representative Butler. <laughs> Is Benfield here? Is uh, Senator Harp here? You're here on that bill. Let's call that SB Are there any questions for um, from the committee on this bill? What? Uh, this is three. Uh, this is eleven ninety. I mean three ninety eight. Excuse me. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, for clarification, would you please? Um, Tell me what the difference will be in terms of, of only one person, one 
uh, entity doing the mental health evaluation and explain why they would then be uh, committed to custody of corrections. Any other questions? I've got a question. Where are these people currently being held? Okay, why don't you just stand up and just tell us what you wanted to tell us, and then you can answer my question when you get around to it. Okay. And you're with the DHR? Mm -hmm. Okay, so as far as my question is where they're being held by the Department of Corrections now, what's the answer to that? That's my question. They, after, they're found, after they're found guilty but mentally ill or guilty but mentally retarded, are there is there particular locations that they're being held? Uh, everyone who comes into our system, sir, is evaluated within 24 hours, even if they're found guilty but mentally ill. And within 24 hours, they're triaged. If they need emergency care for stabilization, they're sent to a crisis stabilization unit or to a hospital. Um, if they need to see a psychiatrist within 24 or 48 hours, uh, that will happen. Uh, likewise, if they need further evaluation from a psychologist within five or seven days, that will happen. Uh, when they come into the system, all this takes place at a diagnostic facility. Uh, our largest diagnostic facility is in Jackson, Georgia, a little ways down the road here, Georgia Diagnostic and Classification Prison. Uh, for males, uh, we have a female diagnostic facility, Metro State Prison, um, a little east of here. And then we have Coastal State Prison in Savannah and Baldwin State Prison in uh, Millersburg. Are these inmates kept separately from other inmates? screened along with everyone else who comes in, and then they're triaged. Those that are at risk for being victimized will be separated uh, from the more predator type. Where are they sent? Where are they separated? Uh, they're separated in each of those facilities. We have uh, special units called supportive living units. That's general inmate population. Uh, we also have infirmaries with crisis stabilization units and acute care units if they're in crisis or need acute care. All right. Are there any other questions?
Yes. A couple. You were the Department of Corrections. Yes, sir. You stated that they are evaluated once they enter into your facility. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, according to, in according with uh, the handout that have been getting, given here. Uh, bullet point number three for in examination and it's also found on uh, page three <clears throat> line uh, 30 it, the bill I'm sorry page three line 30 beginning with uh, the Department of Human Resources shall forward in addition to its examination report, any records may pertain by the such department that it deems appropriate. Um, my question goes back to the last bullet point on this handout here that states that for any examination performed by the Department of Human Resources, a report along with other documents must be received by the Department of Corrections within 10 days. What happens if it falls outside of that 10 days with that individual? You, you're proposing within the 10 days? Yes. Yes. My question is, what if the ones that you're requesting the reports from fall outside of that 10-day window? You don't receive it within 10 days as much. We don't get sent it to DHS uh, to yes. within 10 days? Yes. I don't see the reason we shouldn't be able to do it. I mean, it's, the records are there. It would just be sending them over. I mean, there's not, they're still going to do the diagnosis. It wouldn't hurt the inmate in any way in that they're still doing the exact same diagnostic. But we're going to add it, and they'll have more than they have now because they'll have the person's whole treatment history from us in addition within those 10 days. If for some reason it didn't get there within 10 days, I don't think it would impact at all because it would just be what they're doing uh, now. But <laughs> what would you get there in 10 days if they put out any problem? Okay. And in regards to your, uh, one of the members' comment about where are these individuals held, I, I'm a probation officer and I'm in the jail setting all the time in Gwinnett County. I do know we have a H pod where those individuals are currently held, and that's where uh, they're not intermingled with anyone else. They're isolated to that uh, particular section of the jail. Right. And, and, and our prisons are set up like this. So we, we have separate dorms or units or ponds. Other questions? Uh, sir, uh, Chairman Go ahead, I think. No, go ahead. Right. Well, uh, I'm not. I, I'm not sure. I know how this works, but, and I know. I think I know what we're trying to do. We're trying to save some money and cut out one, one, one exam that may not be necessary. What I'm, what I'm interested in though is, if they, if they go right now to, um, for the, tr for the test with, uh, mental health. Or whoever it is that does that, the DHR. Or, yeah, um, where are, where are they then? Do they stay in the county jail or? We go to jail and do it in the jail. In the jail, okay. And so, is that going to change? No, we're proposing that we don't go to the jail and we don't do the evaluation. Okay. Because, like we said, when we go to the jail, usually within a day or two, they're they're in DOC's custody and they're in diagnostics. And so we do the eval and then they go to Jackson and have the eval redone two days later. Okay. Because they're not in custody. Y'all usually get there. Well, you're going. You're the only ones on site at the county jail, then. We're not on site. We're, we're driving. I mean, our evaluators drive from one of our seven state hospitals there, and and often, I wouldn't say often, but I would say a huge percentage of times they get get there, and the inmate is not there anymore. They've already been transferred, so it's a waste of time. You know, maybe a two hour, could be a two to three hour drive that our evaluators spend going to that jail and then another part of the state <coughs> to do the evaluation, which they may not be there, and then the evaluation is generally not used by. The um, well, under this scenario, though, that won't happen. Mm -hmm. They won't get an evaluation. They just go until they get to the diagnostic center. Mm -hmm. And we would say, when we find out, the Department of Corrections notifies us 10 days before moving the inmate. They send something over to tell us the inmate is going to be moved shortly, and they've been convicted. That would trigger us getting the records and sending it, and hopefully it will be a diagnostic when they get there. That's what we're hoping to do. That feels well. Yes, thank you. I'm still confused. My question is, is uh, again, going to the intent of the legislation. Um, if I'm correct, what you're intending to do is to not do any diagnostics. Is that what you're saying? 
I mean, your department. Yeah, DHR is, 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 is trying to get at so, violations. Right, so if I'm understanding that correctly, then you wouldn't be forwarding any documents within 10 days or any other days because you wouldn't be doing the evaluations. We've already done a pretrial evaluation. Ah. So this is a post-conviction evaluation. Okay. Most of these people have entered an um, insanity plea or they've been incompetent to evaluate. Right. They've been incompetent to evaluate. Very good. Okay. Okay, that clears that up. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, also, on on the bill uh, on page two, um, at lines um, twenty five, and uh, it talks about referral for temporary hospitalization uh, at a facility operated by uh, Department of Human Resources. What what facilities would those be? I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Chairman. How these, thank you. How many of these folks do you evaluate? Eighty a year. This doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your legislation, but just. Uh, how do they get referred to you? Are they referred by the sentencing judge? Are they referred by something y'all discovered before pretrial? Or how do they end up getting this evaluation? Or if, if, if they enter a plea, if they're found guilty by mentally ill, then the sentencing court forwards that to the Department of Corrections. And then the Department of Corrections will forward that to the Okay. So this is only in the cases of people that are sentenced and, uh, uh, and found guilty but mentally ill. That's all. How many, are there any other questions? I've got a question. How many uh, people are in our system that are classified as guilty but mentally ill or mentally retarded in the correction system? A few years ago, Karen Bailey Smith and I gave a talk, sir, on this, and I remember doing the statistics. Those are some stats I don't keep track of because uh, once they come into our system, we triage them according to their mental health needs. And some who are classified as guilty but mentally ill, it turns out, really don't need mental health services or don't need them for very long. Uh, in fact, we have a lot of people come into our system who, when we do a pretty comprehensive mental health evaluation, say, I fled that with the hope of going to Central State Hospital instead of uh, to the Department of Corrections. We'll observe them for a while and often uh, they end up coming off of our caseload. Now, the guilty but mentally retarded, uh, we keep track of, of all our mentally retarded. <coughs> right now, we have a little less than 50,000 inmates in our system and less than 2% uh, of a diagnosis of. Any questions? Are there any discussion by the committee? Is everybody that wanted to speak, was there somebody else signed up on this bill? All right, if y'all would like to sit down, you may, I think. Any questions from the committee? Any further discussion? What's the committee's desire in this matter? been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Do pass. <coughs> Is anybody here on 1406? Um, That is, uh, and, and if, if the, I don't know that she'd want me to, but I'm going to presume that she would mm -hmm. present that bill if the, if the, if the chairman would, would Certainly. entertain that motion. I, cause I, uh, she pro I think she has a child care issue yeah. today, right. but, uh, essentially all that bill is doing is, um, 
allowing the fine to be up to five hundred dollars rather than than uh, being a fine of five hundred dollars in every case I think in, it's uh, an issue as to whether in every case um, there is a the, the, the penalty of five hundred dollars is warranted or not and so this is the bill is in, in uh, an attempt to give the judge some discretion based on the facts in the case as to the amount of the fine up to five hundred dollars rather than making it a flat five hundred dollars Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Knox. Any uh, any discussion about this or questions regarding this bill? From anyone? If not, is there a motion? Pass. Pass. Motion and second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Do pass. I think we're up to Mr. Franklin's bill. 1439. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, House Bill 1439, we've got, uh, there's two versions in our folder. We're, the one we're working off of is LC292324S. This bill is a result of the looting that took place after Hurricane Katrina down in New Orleans, where we all saw it watched with horror as roving gangs would loot they would basically had taken over the city. And when law-abiding people would try to get back into their homes, even with looting going on in, in other areas and no one knew where, that, where these roving bands of thugs were going to go, law enforcement officers were, were confiscating the firearms of these law-abiding citizens, thus leaving them totally defenseless as they returned to their homes and businesses. Uh, section 1 of the bill um, makes it, uh, pro prohibits law enforcement from confiscating or attempting to confiscate uh, lawfully owned and possessed firearms. And um, Section 2 of the bill removes, uh, and that's, excuse me, that's during a state of, of emergency, during a declared official state of emergency then uh, only in that circumstance is, uh, is law enforcement uh, uh, denied, able to, to take someone's firearm who lawfully has it. Section 2 of the bill uh, removes firearms from the emergency powers of the governor where he cannot uh, limit the sale or transportation of firearms. So that is, that is removed with this because if you're trying to flee your home in a state of emergency, whether it's a hurricane, tornado, uh, I don't think we get too many hurricanes here in Atlanta, but in other parts, I, I would imagine on the coast, that would be an issue, whether it's a, you might have a, a tornado, there might be uh, some bio uh, terror attack. Uh, you're going to want to be able to defend yourself and your family uh, from, from the thugs that are, that are out there trying to take advantage of the lawlessness. Our law enforcement does a tremendous job. We applaud them. But uh, they, they can't protect each and every one of us. And if you're law-abiding, then, uh, then you need to be able to protect yourself and your family. Are there any questions for uh, yes. Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank uh, Chairman Franklin for bringing this bill. I think this is a um, response to a, to a real concern and uh, it was highlighted in real life for us. This isn't just a hypothetical. This is a real thing that uh, very much concerns me. Yeah, I'd like to, at appropriate time, offer some friendly amendments that I think um, might close some potential loopholes that I read in it. But again, I would offer those as friendly amendments to Chairman Franklin. Um, well, let's uh, talk about questions first. And then, because I have a question or two I'd like to ask. Well, I, and I've worked on this somewhat with Representative Franklin, too, and I congratulate him on, the, on bringing this bill to us. But I, as I'm reading it again, I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe this is for the Lake Council, if um, is this the only place in that in the uh, in 38351 or elsewhere in connection with that emergency power bill that we passed? I guess it was three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. Is this the only place that it, that it, that firearms appears, or that we that that's likely to be mm -hmm. an issue? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other uh, questions for? Representative Franklin, from anybody else. I have a question. Um, looking at Section A, we're talking about law enforcement officers. 
what does any person acting as a law enforcement officer mean? Is that a person who is fraudulently purporting to be a law enforcement officer? So, is there some sort of deputization that you have in mind there? What does that mean? Um, That's on line. Right, line 14, yes. That would, that would include both of those scenarios. Obviously, uh, you can have someone uh, impersonating a law enforcement officer, which is also a, a criminal offense, and, and trying to take people's possessions from them as they uh, travel, trying to either leave or return to their neighborhoods. It, uh, it could include any, anyone who is uh, trying to assist law enforcement, and they might, they might, uh, they might get a little overzealous if uh if they're called upon all right and um public officer or official i guess that's pretty broad i mean that would be any Th that that could include um you know maybe an agent of a department that has arrest authority that might not be considered law enforcement okay. now this provides that this is a misdemeanor offense is that correct that is correct that was at the wisdom of the subcommittee would um, I, I'm coming down to C now at 22. Um, would conviction of I guess it probably would not a conviction of the misdemeanor would not necessarily require that the law enforcement officer lose his job or commission of the misdemeanor. Normally, I think I, I do know law enforcement officers that have gotten driving under the influence charges that have not lost their job. I know some that have lost their job. Uh, is there anybody from public safety here? That, I see the head of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation back there. Right. Want to comment on that? Well, it's going to depend on the individual's record. Uh, it could be it's probably both the camel's back as far as a person being fired. If he has a misdemeanor charge, if he's a GBI agent. So there may be a possibility that a letter of reprimand would be. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask, thank you. I'd like to ask the author, what, what exactly is the purpose of the letter of reprimand if you made this a crime, and presumably this fellow is being prosecuted, mm -hmm. what's the letter of reprimand supposed to do? It serves as a very strong reminder that you just don't take law-abiding, uh, take guns away from law-abiding Georgians. And uh, his career would probably uh, cease to advance at that point, and uh, that's the that's basically what we're trying to trying to accomplish. Okay. And I have another question. On 38, 38351, I'm not very familiar with that code section. I presume that has to do, as it says, with emergency powers of the governor. Is that correct? Correct. What are the conditions uh, that would be in existence for 38-3-51 authorities to authority to commence? That the governor declares a state of emergency. Okay, and it, it, maybe this needs to be directed to either legislative council or she is here. There she mm -hmm. is. Uh, are there particular types of emergencies that are enum enumerated in 38 51? I mean, I heard talk about a, a meteorological event. Are there other events that are <laughs> talked about? You know, I didn't bring Title 38 with me, I'm sorry. but You don't it's know not, that by heart? And I don't know it by heart. The, <laughs> the list that's in 38351 is the list of the governor's powers in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, that's all right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. She doesn't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, is civil insurrection one of the things included? Maybe you need to know. <laughs> Maybe I do need to know. <laughs> In the event of an actual or impending emergency or disaster of natural or human origin 
or impending or actual enemy attack or public health emergency within or affecting the state or against the United States, the governor may declare that a state of emergency or disaster exists. And then there's they issue um, there's conditions precedent to the governor actually calling it a state of emergency, and it continues until the threat or danger is passed, um, or the emergency has been dealt with, and it can't continue for more than 30 days. The General Assembly, by concurrent resolution, can terminate the state of emergency or disaster, and the governor shall, by appropriate action, end the state of emergency or disaster. And in the code section that's being um, amended, that's section eight. Right. Let's see. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm sorry. The pages are order out of order here. It be, subsection D begins with, in addition to any other emergency powers conferred upon the governor by law, he may a is what's printed here. So that's what it, in within his powers, in addition to other powers conferred. Does that answer your question? Um, Thank I, you. Maybe. Thank well, you. Let me ask the council, if absent the, the, uh, the, um, Absent the, pro the provisions of A and B in here, if you only had, if you only did section two eight, what is the penalty, or is there a penalty if a, if a law, or is there a criminal penalty that is for a law enforcement officer who would take uh, unlawfully take a, a firearm from someone who's lawfully in possession and use of that firearm, not irrespective of the Emergency Powers Act, just you know. Under the code, under the law currently. Well, could it be considered a theft? I don't know. Is it, it, I'm not sure. Is it a criminal offense currently? There's not. No, this is what's making it a criminal offense. Okay. Um, but this would. But this would. Would this? But if we do this bill, it'll only be in the situation where they would be authorized, otherwise authorized, to confiscate the weapon in the case of an insurrection, riot, or under this emergency powers under this particular code section, right? Okay, and so that's the only authorization <coughs> currently to be able to seize weapons, right? Without regard to whether they're being lawfully employed, owned, possessed, or whatever, correct? Okay. And there's no penalty if you do that other than that you would be able to, might be, you could conceivably, it could be a theft by taking or... That's the, that's the best analogy I could come up with. Well, and that's, and that's, but that's, is... That, that's a felony, though, isn't it? Or is it a misdemeanor? Well, but it would be under color of law. It wouldn't be with intent to deprive the owner of the property. I, I assume it would be, you know, unless they were taking them, actually taking them to sell them or something. If they took them to prevent their use in a heated and volatile civil situation, I'm not sure they could be charged with theft. I guess they could, asportation. Um, I, okay, let me be, let me, Matt, one sure. follow up. If, if we pass this, are we limiting this, are we limiting the application of the punishments under this new code section to the, uh, to the situation where there's been a declared emergency by the governor and then this takes place? We're not. We're, this wouldn't. This wouldn't have any application outside of that condition of having an, an emergency declared. Correct. Right. Okay. Mister, if, if you just read. And again, let you guys speak to this. But um, um, on page one, in section one, um, I mean, it doesn't. It should be unlawful for any law enforcement officer, and it goes on. Uh, it doesn't make any reference to a state of emergency there. That's that. That's an example of. That's line sixteen. During a, I got you. I'm sorry. I missed it. Gosh, right in front of me. Sorry. Should should that be should should that be broadened? 
or, or are there cases where it should be brought? I, 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 what we're trying to accomplish is is when there are those states of emergency and there's confusion and yeah. and the like. Uh, I'd like to just keep it dealing with states of emergency. Um, I'm sort of concerned about the situation that attained in the city of Atlanta some years ago. We had a situation where we had riots that went on, civil disturbances. Uh, I'm concerned that this, this proposed law would prohibit law enforcement from removing weapons from civilians that are I realize that it says that they're law abiding at the time I guess that means that they're not visibly committing a crime at the time but they're in a that wouldn't prevent them from being in a place time or place which I mean, it just seems to me it could be quite dangerous to have armed mobs that were unable to be uh, disarmed would be my concern <laughs> Mr. Bankhead. Mr. Chairman, uh, I wasn't here to talk about this bill, but after reading this particular section, it does concern me. Uh, I was there during those riots, uh, and I think it sets a, a, a very dangerous precedent to have a criminal penalty about uh, giving law enforcement, against law enforcement and trying to do their job in a national emergency. And I recommend y'all taking that particular section out, quite frankly. I didn't read it before I came in here, but after looking at it now, it really concerns us uh, significantly. I'm sorry, somebody else want to speak? I too am Oliver Huntington, George Sheriff Association. And we're concerned about this bill as well in terms of it pretty much substituting the judgment of the officer as to the appropriateness of relieving individuals of weapons during periods of our emergencies. Um, and we have the criminal penalty as well. We Everyone has a chance to do a full review without membership, but preliminarily, um, we are very concerned about this legislation. All right. Um, I didn't mean to get into everybody. Is there anybody else that signed up to speak on this bill? Let's hear. Did you have something you want to say? I did want to follow up on your comments. I think I'm just losing control here. but I, <laughs> If I can help you get control or if I need to be quiet, I know you'll help that. me. I know you'll help me, Representative Bearden. Uh, if... Uh, Let's, let's let Representative Bearden speak, and then I'll let you speak, man. To speak on to what you were talking about, to what happened in Atlanta, if you have law-abiding citizens who's trying to get to their families who's armed, and we are allowing law enforcement to take those guns away from them, then you're going to put unarmed law-abiding citizens in the middle of a, of a mass mob. And I think this is what we're trying to do here, is make sure the Folks can protect themselves and their families. That's law by, and they have no reason to have their firearms taken away from them. That's right. up to a law enforcement officer to decide if it's being used unlawfully or lawfully. Now, if I'm swinging a gun around, yelling and screaming, and pointing at people for no reason, then reckless conduct. Swinging it around, trying to get to your family. Once again, you you can't take. Firearms away from law abiding citizens, and you shouldn't be able to. But how are you going to determine that? Well, I hate to say if someone gets shot, I guess that's up to a jury. I hate to use it that way, but a uh, law abiding citizen has the right to defend him, himself, or herself, did or you, his family. Did you have something? Well, let's try and keep the discussion between each other down to minimal. Did you have something, President? I guess I have a late conversation. She just left. She got a bathroom. Oh, okay. Well, my, 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 yes. Good timing. <laughs> I don't want to say where she went. Um, she might have to look back close, actually. Um, but my understanding of the bill is that this is, first of all, this is going to be a pretty limited application. It's only when there's been an emergency declared by the governor under the terms of that code section. And so this is not like going to be every time there's a riot somewhere. And. Uh, though I think even under this scenario that the officer, if he feels threatened and for his own safety, he can still take a weapon under any condition from somebody. That's, that's, he's authorized to do that by law, I think. And so, so this wouldn't just be, you know, your run-of-the-mill local riot, you know, in, in, you know, some section of the city or 
something like that. This is where the governor imp imposes this on the state or some portion of the state anyhow, where there is some unusual occurrence that, that allows this, this act to have application. So. Sure. May I? I want to ask Representative Knox or Chairman Knox a question. One of the one of the scenarios that I sort of see this happening in is that the governor has declared, let's say that uh, the campus of the University of Georgia is uh, in a state of emergency for some reason. Um, maybe because there's there are you know there's some horrible public safety problem going on. And that would probably cause the police to set up and the authorities to set up a cordon around the University of Georgia. And then you might think that there might be parents who have students there who may be appearing at the barricade demanding access to, to go to find their child or student. And they might be coming with weapons. And would this proposal leave the police without authority to control the access of weapons into a location that was in a cordon or to deal with those people at the barricade in such a situation. I, I, I'm, if you're asking me, I'm thinking that that's the, that's the thing that a police officer does every day. He has to make a decision whether someone's being, whether he needs to impose the authority vested in him to maintain order. No matter what somebody's doing, if they're if they got a you know a chainsaw out and you know they're acting crazy with a chain or whatever it is, he has to he has to make a decision to decide whether or not he's going to do something under his power as a police officer to restrain him or ignore him. And I think that's the same thing here. And you know, like I say, if a mob shows up at at uh, Georgia State, I guess you know you know you use whatever force is necessary to make sure they don't they don't cause any problems, you know, I mean, it's not, the fact that you associate in a group doesn't necessarily make you a mob, and the fact that you may have a weapon on you doesn't also, doesn't make you a mob, nor does it make you a threat, or even particularly aggressive, simply because you have it, except in the minds of, you know, some folks are probably pretty squeamish about weapons, period, but, but, but I don't, I don't, first of all, I'm not sure, and maybe Lake Council can speak about this, but I, I'm not sure that the governor under this act can, can declare an emergency only in some you know, like a university campus or something like that. I think that's a local police matter, and I don't think that's what this law is about. This law is where there's a statewide emergency, and he imposes this, like, and this came out of the, you know, terrorist thing, you know, where, you know, you just, you got to clamp down on the whole operation. And I, and I think that's what's what's here, and I'm, I believe that's in the code. I believe that's in this act, that it, he can't do this on a localized basis or, some kind of a rolling uh, martial law or something like that. <coughs> I could be wrong about that. Maybe she can tell us. Representative Cecil. Sure. Um, I lived in coastal Georgia in 1999 when um, we had a hurricane threatened to come through and we, Interstate 16 was locked up both directions heading north towards Atlanta. Um, as a, a leader in Fort Stewart, I had soldiers I was responsible for that we're trying to get to Atlanta to stay with family. It took 15 hours to get from outside of Savannah to Atlanta along I-16. Um, and that was in the context of probably half the folks in that area staying home. If there's any kind of, you know, emergency situation, that's just to me coming from a relatively unpopulated area of coastal Georgia compared to the metro of Atlanta, just, just a glimpse into how bad things can get in some certain disaster situations. I just think in that context with folks, families, people trying to move with food, water, fuel, whatever it is they had to try to get their families out of the way, I don't think it's just Hollywood fantasy to envision there being real problems. And for a county, a city, anyone to say, you know what, there's been problems. If folks are driving in their trucks and their cars through this county and they've got guns, they need to be, they, they can't be here with guns, get rid of all guns. And I, I mean, f leaders trying to do the right thing. Um, I, I think I think we as a body can't be silent on this. I think if, if we want to not make this a criminal offense against a, a, um, 
a law enforcement officer, but we want to say you shall not and let some other um, penalty with respect to their practice apply. I, I don't know what other, if, if law enforcement officers are derelict in their duties and don't follow the law, what, what they can be subject to. I don't know if that's more appropriate. Um, but I do think, you know, the, I mean, I, Second Amendment of the Constitution clearly states the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be, uh, shall not be infringed. And I think that's pretty clear. And I, you know, I think any infringement on that right, it's not a privilege that we license, it's an inherent right. And I think we need to defer towards that somehow. Um, and I just share that, that we, we, that this is an important thing to do. Um, I think it's more, in my mind, a matter of how we do it. All right. Anybody else? Did, did you have some amendments you were going to offer? I did. Um, All right. If you'll hold those one second, because I do want to hear. Yes, ma'am. You want to speak? <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for the witness? If not, I recognize Representative Satsford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got uh, two amendments I propose. I'll explain, um, I guess I'll explain each one as I go. Um, I did have a question, one last question, though. With respect to the National Guard operating in a non federalized capacity, uh, it's my assumption if they've been federalized that this law has no pertinence to them and wouldn't apply. Um, would is it the understanding of the committee that the language as drafted would apply to the National Guard operating in a state capacity under the governor's authority? Is there any sense to the committee on that? Um, and or the author, or was your intent? I, I believe that it would include that operating under the governor's authority, not being nationalized. 
Is that spoken to anywhere in here? Yes, um, I mean, do, do we need to include the National Guard in this laundry list of who can't do this? Or who? Um, or it shall be unlawful for any fill in the blank? Well, I think when the National Guard's acting in a law enforcement capacity, which they do, okay. I think that's addressed. And, mm -hmm. and I, I'm just talking about what's recognized. Go ahead, you're recognized. Uh, at, on line uh, 14, it says law enforcement officer, any person acting as a law enforcement officer, and when the National Guard is sent in, they're sent in at, in order to enforce the law, and so they're acting as law enforcement officers for all intents and purposes, and they can make arrests and Mr. And that, that kind of stuff. Mr. Chairman, that was part of my amendment um, the, to, to line 1415 to, to Chairman Knox's remark. Um, I'll, I'll start the amendment. Should be on, it, uh, it currently reads it shall be unlawful for any law enforcement officer, comma, any person change as to in and on line 15 change officer to capacity. So it would read any person acting in a law enforcement capacity. That could apply to a contractor, a security contractor who's not an official um, per se of a political subdivision but is acting in that capacity or the National Guard. Officer would change to capacity? Acting, any person acting in a law enforcement capacity. And I mean, I'd, I'd open that up to the discussion of the committee, but that's that's a proposed uh, amendment. And I would g further um, on line 15, strike the word or and insert at the beginning of line 16, or order the confiscation of. Begin line 16, or order the confiscation of, so that. Re read it the way it was. I'll read, read the whole section. Uh, starting on line 14, subsection A, it shall be unlawful for any law enforcement officer, any person acting in any law enforcement capacity, or any public officer or official to confiscate, attempt to confiscate, comma, or order the confiscation of during a declared official state emergency, any firearm for any person, so. I don't know if we want to send this all the way up to the governor, do we? <laughs> well, I think that's what you're doing there. Because the governor's going to be ordering the confiscation when he, you know, when he tells his folks to go get those guns. Well, I think we, I mean, I think for a mayor to say, police chief, go out and get the guns, yeah. by gosh, I said so. Yeah. Uh, I think he's culpable. No matter how you know, likely you think the scenario is, that would be a friendly amendment I would offer to Chairman Franklin. Chairman Franklin, there's been a proposed amendment uh, that you can accept or deny. Uh, I'm not certain that that's going the direction I wanted, uh, I intended on the bill as it was when I conceived of it. So I would probably have to, I would be voting against that. All right, it's been declined as a friendly amendment. Do you wish to make it as a formal amendment? I'll withdraw. All right. Are there any other amendments proposed by any member of the committee? I would uh, like to offer one more, again, as a friendly amendment on uh, page two. Um, and again, I, I might um, I might need um, more knowledgeable legal minds than mine. My concern is on line six of page two where we leave explosives in there. What I don't want to do is I don't want there to be a potential um, to, okay, you can't take the guns, but you can take the ammunition. Or I don't know if ex if ammunition is considered a firearm or considered an explosive. Um, I had envisioned it reading, and I can be more specific, but suspend the limit, suspend or limit the sale, dispensing, or transportation of alcoholic beverages, comma, insert combustibles, comma, and explosives other than ammunition for illegally held firearms. And my intent there is only to try to get at um, an authority or a law enforcement officer couldn't take someone's ammunition. Keep your gun, but I'm taking, I'm confiscating the ammo. I mean, maybe it's a technicality. Does, uh, Council, let us know if ammunition is defined as an explosive anywhere in the code. I don't know. I've not heard so of that being, being included in explosives anywhere. 
I guess if you took them apart and made enough powder to make some kind of a bomb or something that would do cause some kind of damage, you might have an explosive. But I don't. Explosion before the bullet gets out. Well, that's true. It explodes in the chamber. That's true. Um, Mr. Chairman, again, in my mind, to the extent any of this matters at all, we need to, I think, take, I think, making some provision that that's addressed is important. Can we read it again? I was just proposing, um, and there are certainly more qualified people to propose language, but would say suspend or limit the sale of dispensing, transportation of alcoholic beverages, comma, I insert combustibles in comma, and explosives other than ammunition for illegally, I'm sorry, other than ammunition for legally held firearms. Is so that the, a friendly amendment? Or would maybe possessed would be better than held? Okay. I'm fine with either. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think if we go by possessed, that probably be would be a good amendment. All right, so you're accepting that amendment? I would accept that. As would you read it to me, the amendment that you accepted, so I know exactly what it is? Mr. Franklin. Uh, Representative. Representative Setzler was the one who had it written out. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of y'all. I'm inserting at the end of line five, after beverages, comma, combustibles, comma, and beginning of line six, before explosives, I'm inserting and. After explosives, I'm inserting other than ammunition for legally possessed firearms, period, and lining through and combustibles. I, th I, think, I think instead of period, you're, you want a semicolon there for the, because it's going to flow on to yeah. Thank section you, Jeremy, number nine. Yes. Does legislative council understand the amendment? I'm glad to hear that. All right. Is there any further discussion on this bill? Hearing no further discussion, are there any further motions to be made on this bill? Mr. Chairman, do have one more question? Yes. Is there um, is there any expectation on behalf of the author to address the issue of criminalizing this, or, or is there some other way to address that that would? meet the concerns of some of the members of the audience. Uh, as the bill was introduced, it was at the felony level, uh, which s would send a pretty strong signal that we don't want you messing with law abiding Georgians. Uh, the, the subcommittee dropped that felony down to a misdemeanor. Uh, it, it, if, if if the committee believes there's some better way to do that than a misdemeanor, um, uh, I'd be glad to, to entertain that, uh, whatever the wish of the committee is. Does there, I don't know where that left us, Mr. Franklin. Want Mr. Chairman, I'm fine with it as, as it is. I just wanted mm -hmm. to give mm -hmm. the committee a chance to address some of the concerns aired by the audience. Yes, please make a comment. If you want to decriminalize this, you strike section B. And under C, you would remember that, relate that to be any, per any person in violation of this subsection, which just goes into another reprimand. That takes the complete criminal, criminal, uh, criminal aspect out of it. Other than, the fir other than line 14, calling it unlawful. <laughs> What's if it's unlawful and you're still seizing something that's legal, I guess you could be looking at a federal statute and Fourth Amendment violation and then go into federal courts. It could still be unlawful. So you could still leave it because it could still leave a Fourth Amendment violation. Mr. Chair, what's the, what's the charge against a police officer who's generally acting out of his scope of authority or? Well, it used to do, be that you uh, suppress the evidence and uh, but we've done away with some of that. Violation of oath. Yeah. Um, 
perhaps a federal civil rights lawsuit, but those are pretty <coughs> slender reads upon which one would rely. I'm just, just suggesting maybe we, whatever we, however we treat this, it ought to be consistent with any other abusive authority. All right. Um, time is growing weary here, and uh, we have some people here on uh, 1193. I'm going to uh, withdraw this for the moment, and maybe it'll give Representative Setzler and, and uh, Representative Franklin an opportunity to confer. Um, I heard a phrase the other day that I guess I should maybe use in this connection. This bill is starting to outkick my coverage. We've gotten into some subjects that are a little broader than, than, uh, than maybe I can cover, and I, I want to uh, give it a, a few minutes at any rate. So let's move on to 1193. Thank Vice Chairman Mumford for covering. Uh, which brings us to House Bill 1193, uh, Representative Knight. Thank you very much. Any questions of the author, and I know he's brought a number of distinguished people to uh, speak on behalf of this bill. Any questions of the author on House Bill 1193? Don't seem, no questions? Move to pass. At the proper time. <laughs> well. I'm going to, we've got some people, some of whom uh, are important to me that I want to recognize at least to see if they want to speak. Mark McDonough. Uh, sir, the Department of Public Safety, we fully support Representative Knight's efforts. This isn't part of our agency legislation, but this is an easy child for us to adopt, and we'd like a favorable consideration, sir. Thank you very much. Questions of, uh, um, uh, of Mark from the committee? 
Bob Keller, Prosecuting Attorney's Counsel. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Keller? Kermit Stokes, State Patrol. Just to uh, reiterate what Sergeant McDonough said, that uh, we appreciate all the work that's been uh, put into this. Uh, we believe it to be a good bill. Representative Knight has done an excellent job working this bill, I know, uh, through, through the process. Questions of uh, Mr. Stokes? Another supporter of your bill, Sandra Michaels, with the uh, criminal defense lawyers. Is Sandy still here? Ms. Terry, she's not here. I think she understands the narrow scope of this bill. And, and, uh, she can I quote you on that to her? You can quote me on that to her. Okay. I think he's living kind of dangerously, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I think, <yeah. laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that I saw him talking to her for quite a while this afternoon. So I'm sure he knows what he's doing. <laughs> Sandy, she left? Yes. Okay. Uh, any further questions or discussion by the committee? What a piece of work, Representative Knight. I hope your next one does this well. Well, you're more confident than I am. Um, what's the pleasure of the committee? Move to pass. Second. We have a motion that we give House Bill 1193 a due pass recommendation. Um, is that by sub? Yes. By committee sub. Um, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I call the question. All in favor of giving uh, House Bill 1193 a due pass recommendation, please indicate by raising your right hand. All opposed. Looks like it's unanimous. All right, now, before the committee leaves, let me tell you what we're going to do, and I, I think... Vice Chairman Mumford for presiding in my absence. I, I needed to be, as Sergeant McDonough needed to be, in appropriations. Uh, it's nice when people are trying to take care of you even when you're not there, Sergeant. Um, here's what we're going to do. Just, just a few announcements on scheduling and other things. Um, there are no, will be no meetings tomorrow not, uh, unless subcommittees are meeting. Any subcommittee meeting? Okay. Um, the next committee meeting will be Monday upon adjournment of the Appropriations Committee. Now, they are scheduled to meet at 3. We have a light <clears throat> rules calendar, which hopefully will stay light. Um, and um, so we're going to meet Monday afternoon and that'll be probably a late afternoon meeting we're going to meet uh, Tuesday afternoon and I'm going to try to start that one about 1.30 because we're, we've got a lot of bills and we've got some bills that I expect will generate a lot of discussion I think we can also meet Wednesday, and that will pr probably be, don't look at me that way now, that will be the last meeting that will be designed to get House bills out and get them over the Senate before crossover day. Um, I'm meeting Monday morning at 10 o'clock. Okay. So I was going to ask when you and... Monday morning at 10 o'clock. Okay. So the Knox subcommittee is going to meet Monday at 10. When are you meeting? That's a good question. I can't remember. Where? To be announced? I think, I think we're meeting Tuesday morning. That's what I think. Everything that's, everything that's been assigned is going to be on that. Okay. And I've got just only two or three more. To, uh, and, and I'm going to make some announcements on how we're going to handle some specific bills. So the Mumford subcommittee will have an announcement forthcoming as to when they will be meeting and what they will be dealing with. Um, I've 
I've, I've told, I've spoke to Chairman Franklin. He's going to get some language changes made to uh, House Bill um, 1493. And um, so that will go back on um, probably Monday. Is that 1493 or 1439? 1439. Uh, the bill we just had. <clears throat> um, Excuse me? Where is Subcommittee 1 going to be meeting on Monday? Uh, I, I, I haven't heard back from Diane. She may have known about me, and I didn't get it. I'm assuming it's going to be in... 132. 132. Um, I, just told, I just told her what bill and what time. And okay. She'll notify us all. It is my intention to take up um, House Bill... Um, get my numbers right. 1222 Monday afternoon. Uh, given that, I don't expect we'll take up more than two or three bills Monday afternoon, but we will take up Chairman Franklin's bill. Um, Tuesday for the full committee and, and plan to spend the afternoon with me, we're going to take up uh, House Bill... Um, We get a chance to redeem ourselves in this committee. We're taking up, uh, here it is, House Bill 1501. We'll come back to full committee. This, as many of you will recall, uh, was the bill that uh, Re Representative Lindsay had that got to the floor and then was recommitted. But it was under a new number, and it's now been significantly narrowed. And so we're going to take that back up in uh, full committee on Tuesday. In addition to that, I, I plan to take up a bill that we had uh, that Representative Setzler chaired a special subcommittee on last year, and that's House Bill 243. I plan to take that up Tuesday, which may have some discussion. Um, And then there will be a, a number of bills added to Tuesday. Um, let me make um, a couple of other announcements, then we'll be out of here. Um, House Bill 1497. It will be assigned to the Mumford Subcommittee. That's by Representative Knight. Did you do the, did you or Tom do the companion to this one? This is the constitutional amendment. Did you do a? I don't think so. Guy Singer? I think it's on. Okay. All right, then I'm going to assign to you, this is the companion, the constitutional amendment, H.R. 1228 to the Knox subcommittee. I'm also... Um, I don't know. I mean, it's better than it was. Um, Chairman Knox, I'm going to put uh, House Bill 1490 in uh, your subcommittee because it has to do with lakes. But it may come out of your subcommittee because it may leave our committee. But 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 the author won't say hearing, and I want to help him move his bill along, so I want to make that assignment today. But that may change on Monday. But but for the time being, if you would schedule that one. Um, oh, yeah. Well, um, hopefully. Well, no, it won't be out of it. So we won't go into one. So... I'm going to leave that one with you. Don't have a. If you need to, we could have a short subcommittee on it. Maybe okay. Tuesday. Okay. Um. I think that's all I had. Um. Now to the members of the committee and other members that are not here that you might see. Um, 
if there's a burning, burning, burning issue. I mean, we're down now truly to the uh, final seconds as far as House bills as in terms of the committee process. So uh, if, if you have something that you need to move on, you need to talk to me. I've tried to accommodate this committee first. <clears throat> um, and uh, I'll continue to do that to the extent that time allows it. Any questions? If not, I see Chairman Crawford back there, which is not a good sign for me. Any questions? Any other business come for the committee? If not, we'll stand adjourned, and we'll meet Monday afternoon upon adjournment of appropriations.